Lord, as we bring these gifts and the light of Christ begins to go out to the whole world, may these gifts help bring that light to those in need, to those that need that light in the darkness far beyond these walls. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seen. The scripture today is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 41 to 52. And if you have the Pew Bibles, using those, it is page 934, back in the New Testament, 934, if you'd like to follow along, in that particular Bible, 41 to 52, this, it's called The Boy Jesus in the Temple. Now, every year, his, that is Jesus' parents, went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw, the, saw him, they were astonished and his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them, and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. God grant us understanding and may the Holy Spirit help to inform our interpretation and understanding of these words. Let us pray for a moment. God, grant us understanding as we turn to your scriptures, as we seek guidance to live the Christian life today. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, today we have a very unique story in the Bible. It's, it's a glimpse of Jesus at the age of 12. We see him being born, and then we see him at age 12. And there's really nothing before or nothing after until then we see him at age 30, beginning his ministry at the time of baptism. And so it's a very unique story in the Bible. Now, there, there have been a lot of books written about the, Jesus the early years. Um, but those books are, <laughs> they, they are fiction, sometimes unfortunately made to look as fact. Or, or Jesus' trip to India, you may, you may have heard about that one. Again, often unfortunately, books like this, are, which are fiction, are made to look like fact. But here we have the biblical story of Jesus appearing in the temple at age 12, and we really could call this a coming-of-age story. Because we have a 12-year-old kid who, like many other kids, um, has, you might say, a misunderstanding with his parents. parents don't, the parents don't really understand what he's doing or talking about, and he's a little baffled by all their anxiety. Speaking of anxiety, 
um, uh, back when we had gone, gone back to seminary a, a second time, and uh, Jenny was oh, about three or four years old, uh, we were back at seminary, it was north of San Francisco in, in San Anselmo, and, and I'd gone back to do another degree program, and Florence was doing a, a degree program at another school. Jenny was three or four years old and starting into some of the preschools in the area, and she had gone over to someone's house, I think after school or something like that, and I went over to the house to pick her up. I get to the house... Lo and behold, I find out she's not there. And they said, well, she, she already left and went walking home. She's three or four years old. So this was one of those moments, 15 minutes of terror in your, in your life. And they didn't seem to know where she was. She, she left the house. I was not a little upset with the people there, with the adults there, and then began this frantic search of 10, 15 minutes of uh, more terror probably than I've ever had or as much it ever in my life. And finally, I find her getting close to where our apartment was that just, she just went walking on her own back to our house. So, The story that we have today is a very human story. And with all the emotions involved in it, a pre-adolescent and his journey off on his own and his, the anxious moments, not moments, but the anxious days as this story tells it, of his parents. What does this glimpse of Jesus at age 12 tell us? First of all, I think it tells us something about his parents at that time, his parents' view of him. They viewed him in many respects as any other 12-year-old that they lost track of in the caravan out of the city and that they go back in great anxiety searching for him. It also says that they were astonished at what was going on in the temple. And that his reply, they didn't understand. Although it often says Mary is pondering these things in her heart. There, I begin, I I believe they're beginning to put things together about his life. And who he may be at this age. But there's still a great deal of consternation about what is going on. And there is a lot of misunderstanding. What about Jesus' self-understanding at age 12? We we believe, our creeds tell us that Jesus was fully human, fully divine. A lot of times when when we're talking and studying about Jesus' divinity, we forget about his humanity. And when we're talking and stressing Jesus' humanity, we forget about his divinity. It's this strange balance always going back and forth and we're trying to get the whole piece of it. But sometimes we forget that Jesus was a 12-year-old boy once upon a time and that he was growing up and that his understanding of himself was growing as well in, in that human frame of reference. And he understood that he needed to be in that temple setting talking with teachers that were his elders and beginning to understand things greater Don't you know that I need to be in my father's house? Which which father are you talking? Of course, they're asking him, which father are you talking about? They're thinking all the time. But of course, our understanding is that he's talking about God. That he's getting closer and closer to God. But then an interesting thing at the the close of the story, it, it says Jesus returned home with his parents and remained obedient. Very significant fact of this story. Jesus didn't stay and become some child guru. But he went home to a good Jewish home and, got, and went back to the basics and back to the study of the law and back to the synagogue and back to his hometown 
And that's where he grew up. That's where he became what he was to become by going back to the basics, back to the home, back to home with his parents. It was, I believe, the time in the temple for him at age 12 was also a foreshadowing. And this is something that biblical writers do all the time. When they tell a story, they're telling us stories that are foreshadowing things to come. You read the prophets, they're foreshadowing things to come. You read these stories of Jesus, they're foreshadowing his time with the elders and the teachers and the scribes later on that would become at times very conflictual and that would be a, a, a major part of leading him to the cross. Jesus, it says, increased in wisdom and in stature and in years and in favor with God and man. Jesus increased in wisdom. This, I think, is a key for us today. And what does this say to us? It says to us, first of all, that the Christian life is not something that's meant to stand still and static. That we learn a few Bible stories when we're children and we come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior as Christians and then everything just stops. That's all, that seems to be all we need. That's not what the Christian life is about or what it was ever meant to be by God. The Christian life is a dynamic process that when we come to Christ at whatever age that is, young or as an adult, that that begins a work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and that we grow. If we're not further along that Christian spiritual life path today than we were five years ago, then there's something missing that needs to be there. And five years from now, if we're not further along that path, then there's something missing and we need to remedy that. Because the Christian life is dynamic, it's growing. We're getting, as Jesus grew closer to God, we're, we are getting closer to God. Or that's the way it is supposed to be. That's what God intends. So in that sense, the Christian life is lifelong. We talk about lifelong learning all the time. The Christian life is lifelong learning. And not just studying and not just reading, but lifelong practice. As you practice, you grow in faith. As you grow in faith, you practice. It, it, they, they feed each other as a whole. Jesus increased in wisdom. Those are words for us as well. How do you, though you asked, well, Steve, okay, how, how do you measure growth in a spiritual way? Is that something you even can measure? Seems a little bit vague. It doesn't seem so scientific. Well, there, yes, there are definite ways you can measure the spiritual growth. And I'll, I'll give you one standard today. And there are others, but I'll give you one standard that you can go by. And that if you look in the book of Galatians, and you look at Paul's writings in that book, he talks about the fruits of the Spirit. This is one wonderful measuring tool we have to see are we increasing in Christian spiritual life wisdom or not so much. And we look at that and we look at all those elements and then we see where we are on those, on those scales. And Paul talks about love. How we're, how we're doing with, with love of God and love of neighbor uh, that is giving of ourselves towards someone else's benefit or toward their growth. We talked about love several, several weeks ago and definitions of that, but one great one I like is to, to make it possible for the other to grow spiritually. How are we doing with joy in our life? And joy isn't something that goes, goes up and down like happiness. Joy is a deep abiding sense of the presence of God in our life. And how are we doing with peace? Are we makers of peace? 
How are we doing with patience? We've talked about patience. How are we doing with self-control, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness? How are we doing in the fruits of the Spirit in our lives? Now, if we look at a bunch of those go, whoa, I'm, I'm, I was doing better five, five years ago than I am today, then that's a signal. That's a big red fly, flag. There's something, there's a lack in our lives and our relationship with God, and we want to work on that. We want to remedy that. Whether it is worshiping in a more regular way, whether it is studying with other Christians in, in a regular way, or fellowshipping with them, and there's no better way to grow in the Christian life than to get together with other followers of Christ. Really, really tough to do it alone. And so finally, as I said, Jesus returned home to be with his parents and to grow in his relationship with God. Jesus returned home and he got down to basics in that good Jewish home. Our clue could be that story and what it says to us about getting back to the basics. The daily Christian walk. Are you praying daily in some way? Are you worshiping not just Sunday, but worshiping God, giving yourself to God every day? Are you educating yourself in the Christian walk and mission and service? Are you getting out to serve beyond these walls in one way or another? This story says that Jesus increased in wisdom after he returned home to the basics. It's a word to the wise. I want to close today with a story from um, a story from Pastor David Steele, and I've mentioned um, I've mentioned him before in a previous sermon. He was a pastor, Presbyterian pastor, passed away uh, years ago, but he wrote stories of Bible stories and wrote about the Bible stories and the Christian life, and with with great humor and. Uh, a little different take on things than, than you usually get. And I want to close with his little story of Jesus in the temple. We wait for what seems a bit more than eternity for that magical moment of pa and ma eternity. Prenatal suspense seems to stretch into years. It provides the occasion for worries and fears. It provide, uh, is so when we see our offspring in wrinkled repose, and it has the right number of fingers and toes, from our hearts comes a prayer that is real, if informal. Thank God that our baby is healthy and normal. Now, normal is nice, but that term is too mild to describe the uniqueness we see in our child. For each set of parents knows perfectly well that their own little tyke will achieve and excel. And each word or action is carefully sifted for signs that their darling is specially gifted. Why those children are ours, we know by all means there is genius embedded down there in them genes. <laughs> We've read the account in the paper, I guess, about the five-year-old boy playing masterful chess or the girl who at six basks in critical praise and flawlessly playing Chopin's Polonaise. But we search high and low for some signal that our own budding genius is starting to flower. So it's easy to sense the, pre, the parental elation that Mary and Joseph felt on their vacation. That big city tour was essentially done when those parents lost track of their 12-year-old son. I guess they were frantic, perhaps even wild, as they tried to uncover some trace of their child. They turned to the temple for guidance and prayer, and to their amazement, young Jesus was there. Where the scholars had gathered to pontificate and engage one another in heady debate, 
There in their midst sat this pre-adolescent with a light in his eyes that was nigh incandescent. His questions revealed a superb intellect and were treated with deep, deep academic respect. The young couple perceived that at last they had run onto signs that they had quite a talented son. I suppose that those parents, as other folks do, toyed with sending their boy to Jerusalem U. It appeared he could easily garner permission to matriculate soon with an early admission. Their dreams of his future became crystal clear. A quick PhD, then a brilliant career. Or maybe he ought to try preaching a while, for a good teenage guru is always in style. When a child shows some genius, here are the results. He is pushed into rigors more fit for adults. And the pressure applied is the reason that plenty of prodigies burn out before they are 20. Thank God this temptation was duly resisted by Mary and Joseph, who wisely insisted that Jesus come home, as they certainly did, and grow up in their house like a regular kid. That's why, when at 30, on that crucial day, that he started to preach, Christ had something to say. Let us pray. Oh God, we pray that this may be another lesson for us in our own lives to be a part of the daily basics of growth in the Christian spiritual life, of study, of worship, of mission, of service, of education. And that we may grow in wisdom and that we may grow closer to you so that our lives as followers of you through your son have something to say to the world in the name of Jesus Christ we pray let's remain standing and then uh, together let's read the affirmation of faith that's in your bulletin there I believe in Jesus I believe he is the son of God I believe he died and rose again I believe he paid for us all. I believe he is here now, standing in our midst, here with the power to heal now and the grace to forgive. Let us join hands, please. Find someone to join hands with as we receive the benediction. Okay, there okay. okay. we go. Okay. And now as we go from this place, God's blessings, may we be lights for Jesus Christ in this world. Amen. God bless you all.